4. I'm going to start in, in John chapter 4. We've been looking at the subject on and off this year. Uh, it's our theme of thy kingdom come. And really, a person has to des- decide who will be your king. You know, are we really going to take that attitude? You know, Lord, your kingdom come to my heart, to my life, to my time, to my work. Uh, it's, it's a big decision. And uh, Jesus said the only way to join his kingdom is through the new birth. It's by being born again. I've heard people say, oh, they're, they're those born again kind of Christians. <laughs> now, they may have a certain wrong meaning, but uh, Jesus said that's the only kind of Christian there is. It's a born again Christian. Um, I know some people have distorted that, that term. Uh, Satan wants to tempt us. He wants us to follow his kingdom. You know, he, he says, and he can even use scripture to, to tempt us. Uh, but God tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his, his righteousness. Uh, God's purpose for us, our king's purpose is we be salt and light, uh, that we serve him. Uh, last week, we, we looked at the subject of being like our king, to be like Jesus. Well, this, this morning, I want us to look in John chapter 4 and uh, the subject of worshiping the king. He's certainly worthy of our worship, isn't he? And this is a, a, a time when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. And uh, she, uh, uh, she had a certain background and, and heritage. Of course, she was a Samaritan. Uh, she was also a woman. Had, Jesus uh, told her, go bring your husband. I'd like to talk to him too. And she, she, her answer was, well, I have no husband. Jesus said, well, you're, you've said right. You've had five husbands. And uh, the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> uh, and in verse 19 is where I want to start reading. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> uh, that spoke to her heart. <laughs> verse 20. And here's her religious question that she has for him. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You know, a lot of times people have a, a religious question or a religious statement. Uh, basically, she's saying, uh, you know, what religion is right? How should we worship? Jesus, verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We worship what we, uh, I'm sorry, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We we'll just stop reading, reading there. You know, she asks, which religion is right? How, how should we worship? Where should we worship? And Jesus basically says to her, it's not the place, it's the person. And he makes an interesting statement to her. Salvation is of the Jews. We, we know what we're worshiping. For salvation is, is of the Jews. There in verse, verse 22. And we need to understand, uh, the Savior is only Jesus. <laughs> and uh, Jesus is, is sharing that with her and with others as he uh, spends his time and then as he gives us uh, the scripture. Uh, listen, if you hear of a Savior who's from America or from China or from anywhere else, he's not the Savior. He has to be a Jew and he has to have a certain heritage and he has to be the Son of God. He has to be the Savior. Uh, and Jesus is, is teaching there, you must know God the Father. And the way to know him, as, as he goes through, is only through the Son. Salvation is of the Jews. Later on in verse 29, this lady says, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? I, I think she believed. I think she believed that he was the Christ. Now, later in verse 41, many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. See, salvation is of the Jews. And even more specifically, salvation is of that one Jew, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's a narrow way. Listen, it's only through Jesus. Uh, you, you could go on and on about what it's not because everything else is not. <laughs> you know, it's not through religion. It's not through a church. It's not through a pastor. It's not through a baptism. 
you go on and on, couldn't you? It's only through Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus was sharing with this woman. And he, was, he shared with her how to worship the Lord. We have to worship God in spirit and in truth. And that, uh, that includes being born again. You know, for a person to be born again, God's Holy Spirit draws them and draws them to the truth. When Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, well, they're drawn to Jesus. John 17, Jesus said, thy word is truth. Uh, the scripture is how we know the truth. We'll know the truth and the, the truth will make us free. Uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's very clear, uh, the Bible says, we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, God's Holy Spirit could convict a person in their heart and they not respond to the truth. You know, they could come under conviction. I've, I've seen people where it's happened. They, they've even wept, but they've not turned to the truth. It's not enough to have just the Spirit. We've also got to have truth. It's not enough just to have the truth. <laughs> Some, the, the Bible says uh, that people aren't going to come unless the Spirit draws them. And uh, we need to understand Jesus is the truth. It's the beginning, uh, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's also the continuance of Christianity, you know, serving and, and walking with Jesus. Uh, let me get you to turn to Matthew 15. And I want to show you just the opposite of what Jesus has taught here. Sometimes it's uh, good to learn by <clears throat> contrast. <clears throat> and in, in Matthew, Matthew 15... Let me start reading in, in verse 1. Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Let me just stop reading there. What he's saying is, they had a tradition that if they had given themselves and them, their money to God, they didn't bother to obey the command that said, honor your father and mother. If, if they had elderly parents that needed help, they'd say, oh, sorry, can't help you. We've given all our, it, it all belongs to God. That didn't mean they didn't spend money on themselves and things like that. It was just a, a way to get around doing what they knew they should do. And, and Jesus said to them, uh, You've made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. And listen to how he, he uses strong words here, verse 7. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men." See, their question to Jesus was, why aren't your disciples following the tradition of the elders? And Jesus very rarely answered people's questions. <laughs> he, he gave them a, a question in return. He said, well, why do you transgress the command of, commandment of God by your traditions? And what you have here in this passage is people who were not worshiping God in spirit or in truth. Jesus points that out very clearly. He says, there's a problem with your heart. When we're talking about our spirit, worshiping God in spirit, we're talking about our heart. We need to have a heart that's right with God. I was thinking about that as we were singing this morning. Now, I don't know how you are, but sometimes I don't pay any attention to the words I'm singing. I'm thinking about something else. Listen, that's not worshiping God in spirit. Uh, my, uh, there's all kinds of thoughts that can go through our minds when we should be honoring the Lord. Now, it, Worship is not just something you do at church. I don't want to confuse that, that issue. Uh, but there's times when we're, we're using words, I'll use the word pretending that we're worshiping the Lord, when in our mind we're somewhere completely different. And uh, these people's hearts were not right with God, and their words were not right with God. The, the truth. They had completely abandoned what God had said was right, the commandments of God. Uh, listen, these weren't the, the suggestions of God. 
you know, I know there's things in Scripture we think, oh, I wonder what that means. Listen, the commandments of God are not like that. <laughs> he doesn't say, you know, if you got time, you, you should try to do this. He says, here's what you're to do. And uh, these were people who neither in spirit or in truth were, were worshiping the Lord. Their heart and their doctrine were wrong. Now, let me point something out here. That was their culture. Now, for them to be saved, they had to be saved out of their culture. And you see the, the difficulty as you go through the book of Acts and, and you know, the Gospels. These were people who had the Jewish culture, the Old Testament culture that had been distorted. And now they had to come to Christ. And, and there were things that if they didn't do them, oh, their culture would condemn them. There were things that if they did them, oh, their culture would condemn them. And to be a Christ, do you know that the word Christian was used first as a, as a term of ridicule? Oh, those Christians, you know. These were people who, who abandoned their culture for Christ. And you know, the same is still true today. You, you see it all the time. There's people who, they come right up to Christ and they consider and they walk away for their culture because it's too scary to step outside of their tribe, their culture. But we ministered in Fremantle for quite a while. Uh, very Catholic, very tribal, <laughs> very family, you know. Oh, do I dare trust Christ and not be a, you know, whatever, a Catholic. Uh, these were people who had a lot of religion but they didn't worship the Lord. We need to be careful, folks, that that's not us. We need to be careful that even though we've trusted Christ, we're not actually worshiping Him in our heart and in our beliefs. You know, there's a real danger that we'll listen to people instead of to God. That's what he said these, these folks were doing. Uh, you, you've drawn nigh with your mouth, and you've honored me with your lips, but not your heart. Uh, verse 9, in vain do they worship me. In vain. That, that means it's useless. It's empty. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Uh, so this thing of worship, God says it's to be in, in spirit and in truth. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. You know, we live in a generation, I guess you might say, where when people talk about worship, it's very outward. It's very, uh, there's a lot of heart in it in, in many places. There's a lot of enthusiasm, I guess I might say, but it's not always according to truth. And sometimes it's not their spirit, it's, it's their flesh. That's going on. We, we need to be careful in our worship. The, the Bible says uh, worship is not, we don't worship to manipulate God. We're not trying to get God to do something for us. That's heathenism. Uh, if you've ever looked into, you know, false religions, and, and especially those that worship, you know, the, the old-fashioned gods that the Romans had and, and so on, they were always trying to appease their gods. Because they were, they were very... Um, you never knew what they were going to do. And so they were always worried that they might do something bad to them. So they were always, you know, that, that's why they would, some religions, they'd throw their children to the crocodile, hoping to appease their God and make him like them and so on. We don't have to do that with God. That's not why we worship. We're not trying to impress God. Uh, worship is not to please ourselves. You know, we don't just, if you have a worship service, let me tell you, folks, it's not for you. <laughs> it's not to make you happy. It's to worship the Lord. It's to honor the Lord. Uh, look at Philippians chapter 3. Uh, there's a couple of verses here that you need to know on, on this subject of worshiping God in our spirit. Philippians 3, verse 3. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Philippians 3, 3 says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He's talking about several things here, but one of the things we can see is when we're worshiping God, our confidence is not in our flesh. It's not, oh, that felt good. <laughs> Listen, there's lots of things in life that can feel good that have nothing to do with whether you're worshiping God or not. 
Uh, it's not a body thing, it's a spirit thing. Uh, our rejoicing, he says, there is in Christ. We do, listen, we do want enthusiasm, but it's not just enthusiasm. It's not just a certain feeling. We want a heart that's right with God. Uh, you can have enthusiasm and feelings without having a heart that's right with God. Uh, there are some so-called forms of worship today that they're, they're very enthusiastic. But listen, if, if you trace it back, they're really also very heathen. You can, you can get pictures of people bouncing up and down and, you know, carrying on and, you know, whoa, 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 the Lord. Listen, you can get the same thing of people worshiping other gods and uh, other countries and so on. I was talking to a girl, it's been a few years ago, and she was saying out there at church, they stand up on the, on the seats and, and, and dance. And what do you do? I say, oh, we don't do that. Oh, really? What, what do you do? <laughs> it's like, well, if you don't do that, what do you do? Uh, we need to be careful that we're not just doing it in the flesh. And we need to be careful that it's our heart that's being drawn to the Lord. Uh, one of the things that indicates to me that some of these forms are wrong is the performers oftentimes move from the church stage to the world stage. Now, one of the first winners of Australia's Got Talent. He was a church performer. Now he's, well, you got nothing to do with the church. You'd never know he, where he came from. Uh, it's not confidence in the flesh. And we need to understand that. But secondly, Go to Colossians chapter 2 and, and verse 23. It's not our will. Colossians 2 verse 23. Now I'll read more, but he, he says in verse 23, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of, uh, of the body. Will worship has to do with our will. There's a sense in which we worship our own will. I got my way. I'm the king. Um, let, let me read from verse 20 there. He gives the context. He says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. And then he says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Uh, God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, there are people who, he, he uses the phrase here, the neglecting of the body. There are people who go to the other extreme where they say, oh, I'm, I'm worshiping God by not looking after myself or, or by de denying things to myself and, and so on. Uh, spirit, that, you know, they, they try to come across as spiritual uh, by hurting themselves even. Uh, you read of people who put glass in their shoes or they'll crawl or there's people who beat themselves. Uh, there's certain religions that are very prone to this Buddhism and, and, and different things. But even in uh, false Christianity, uh, very opposite to what, how God says we're to treat our body. God says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. Listen, treat God's body with respect. You're not worshiping God by neglecting your body. You're not worshiping God by hurting your body. Uh, worship God in spirit. Uh, it's, it's not a, so much a flesh thing. Uh, look after and respect what God has given you. We worship God in, in spirit. It's not my will. It's not my flesh. It's the spirit of God. And it's, a, it's the goal that God has given to us. He says we, we need to worship him in spirit and in truth. Worshiping God in, in truth has to do with the word of God, doctrine. You know, back in, in Matthew there, he, he said to them, you, you've made God's commandments, you just ignored them. What's the word that he used there? Um, You've made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. They honored their traditions above God's truth. Uh, the Pharisees had lost both spirit and truth. And, and let me tell you, one of the biggest enemies of true worship is hypocrisy. You, you know, they, they had lots of religion, they had lots of worship, but it wasn't true worship. They weren't worshiping God the Father. They weren't worshiping God. And you know, sometimes we can have words without heart. Uh, John said in 1 John 3, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
Uh, we used to sing a little song, what you are speaks so loud that the world won't hear what you say. You know, what we do uh, shows a lot about what we believe. There's a, a lot of religion that has forms without meaning. You know, rituals and ceremonies and so on. Uh, a couple of good examples in our society are burials and baptisms. <laughs> you, you can go to a funeral and, man, you'll hear the word of God and, and people just ignore it. Even many times the person reading it is not living that, the word of God and not believing it. Uh, you go to, and when I talk about baptism, I'm talking about baby baptisms. Um, what are those called when they, they have that? It's uh, christening. Yeah, how many christening? I had somebody call me one time and ask if we did christenings. I said, no, no, we don't do that. Uh, I said, that's, that's not in the Bible, so we don't, we don't do that. Well, who would I talk to, to to get that done? I said, well, you need to find a church that doesn't believe the Bible. They'll, they'll, they'll do it. Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Off they went. Um, and for many people, they go to a christening, and the main reason they go is they're going to get drunk afterwards. Man, talk about not worshiping God in, in truth. Um, form without meaning. And I mentioned earlier, I, I think sometimes we do the same when we sing songs and pay no attention to the words. Or we sing songs where we don't really believe the words. God says we're going to give an account. Uh, Psalm 47, he says, God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. God wants us to understand what we're doing. Uh, sometimes we replace God's words with our words. You know, like, uh, like they did in, in uh, Matthew chapter 15, uh, where they had their traditions, and their traditions were, were more important. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, verse 14. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4 and, and verse 14. God wants our worship to be in spirit and in truth. Uh, our heart right with him, uh, our beliefs, our doctrines based on, on his word. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, he says, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ uh, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Uh, God wants who we are and what we do to be based on His Word. Uh, there are those who will try to confuse us. Uh, there are uh, those who, who will use cunning craftiness. Uh, they lie in wait to deceive, He says. Uh, but we can speak the truth in love. We can know the truth, and the truth makes us free. See, true worship is based on the knowledge of God. The way we know God is by His Word. It's not just something that occurs to us. Uh, our main worship is around the Word. You know, when we sing, uh, that's a good thing, and we sing unto the Lord. But you know, the main worship we do when we meet together is as we hear God's Word talk. That's our main worship studying and preaching and so on. And God says we need to do that with understanding. In uh, 1 Corinthians 14, when he's talking about tongues and, and some of the different things that, that uh, were going on, he, he says, I'll pray with the Spirit, I'll pray with understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit, I'll sing with the understanding also. God is not just looking for us to have an experience. He wants us to know what, what's going on. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, he said, God is not the author of confusion. And later on, he says, let all things be done decently and, and in order. Uh, true worship is based on understanding him, knowing him, honoring him. Um, in, in Ephesians, he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Uh, Proverbs, there, there's an interesting portion I wanted to read. Proverbs 2, this occurs a lot where he says, If thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandment with, commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hidden treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. See, it's as we go to God's word that we'll particularly worship him 
and will worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, we don't need to look for an experience outside of God's word. Uh, we don't need to look for just some thrill in the flesh. We need to look for the Lord. And in spirit and in truth, uh, God wants us to, to worship him. Uh, the psalmist in Psalm uh, 45, he used a word, he said, my heart is indicting a good matter. It's not a word we use very often now. What he was saying is, my heart is overflowing and I've just got to share it with you. <laughs> That's worshiping the Lord. Yeah, as we get into his word and as God deals with our heart and, and with our actions, uh, you know, worship starts with understanding. The more you understand God, the more you'll worship him. I can, I can guarantee you that. The more you know about God, the more you'll worship him. He's worthy of worship. And that knowledge leads to reverence. When you, when you know about the Lord, you'll reverence him. Look, if you would, at Psalm 29. Psalm is usually pretty easy to find. It's right in, well, I don't know where it is in these electronic Bibles. How do you find the middle of an electronic Bible? I don't, I don't know. Hold it up and flap it open now. Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. <laughs> give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. He says several things there about worship. Uh, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Uh, that means we, we treat him with respect. We honor his words. Have you ever had somebody treat you with disrespect? Uh, you know how awful it feels uh, to to discount what you say or what you do or who you are. Listen, God is worthy of praise. God is worthy of worship. The glory due unto his name. And he, he says there that we should worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In the beauty of holiness. Not, not in a carnal way. Not in a fleshly way. He, God says in spirit and in truth. And one of the things that means is we deal with sin. You know, even as Christians, we deal with our sin. We confess our sin and we forsake our sin. And he says there in, in verse uh, 2, Give unto the Lord glory and strength. There, no, it's verse 1, sorry. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. That means we serve him. We serve him uh, with our strength. You see, worship is understanding. Worship uh, that... As we understand the Lord, we'll, we'll reverence Him. And as we reverence Him, we'll serve Him. And we'll, we'll want to uh, be his, his servant. Worship uh, leads us to service. In Hebrews, he says, Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's why we do it. We love the Lord. We worship Him. Uh, in Matthew, when Jesus was being tempted, He said to Satan, Basically, you get out of here. Get thee hence, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. As we worship him, we'll, we'll serve him. If you're not... Let me get this right, right, right around. You're not worshiping God if you're not serving him. That doesn't mean that at all times we're doing something. Uh, but God calls us to submit to his kingdom. Who, who is it that serves? It's the servant. A servant is one, uh, the word worship means to bow down. When you're worshiping, when you really worship the Lord, you're saying, Lord, you're the king. You're the one who's, who's in charge. And that's, that's the way it should be. You know, Paul recognized that. When he introduced himself, he'd say, I'm a servant of the Lord. Now, that's who we are. Uh, we are subject to the king. And I would ask you the question this morning. Whose servant are you? Who do you worship? Thy kingdom come? Well, we need to be worshiping the king of that kingdom. If you stood before God, would he say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant? Jesus said to the lady there in John chapter 4, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, there, there's a lot more for, we can understand here. But you know, we need to just apply these things to ourselves. Uh, is my heart right with God? Are my beliefs 
what God would have them to be? Am I acting on, on my beliefs? Or am I putting my thoughts above God's thoughts? Worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Uh, I think there's something for each one of us here this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. I, I don't know what, what he might be convicting you about, but uh, I think there's areas of our heart. I think there's areas of our beliefs uh, that God would have us to be more like Jesus. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, help us to understand what it is to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to apply it to our, our lives, to our actions. Father, we do want you to recognize that you are the king. And we want to be your servants, your, your subjects. Help us as a church to reach out to our community as, as your servants. Uh, Lord, help us to minister and to uh, be like Jesus. Father, I pray if there are those here this morning that are not saved, that they would see that they need to submit to you as king, that they need to repent and believe the gospel. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go to page 1.